Good evening. I'm Adriano Paranaiba, an academic director here at MIDSIS Institute Brazil. I'm delighted to open this great and the first of a monthly academic seminar producing with a, a partnership with Mises Brazil and Heike Global College. In this first and great uh, uh, seminar academic, uh, we're talking about FA Hike. And I thought uh, that a better way to celebrate the great economists than have uh, a conversation with two current great economists and that's what we're planning to do to, to do this night and this evening so let me introduce the great economists to start it now um, fabio barbieri master and doctor in economics from the university of sao paulo professor tom Hazlitt, professor of Clemson university and former economist of the u.s federal communication concession and uh, follow them uh, a question and answer session with Edson Gatti, CEO and founder of High Global College, will talk with us, okay? So let's start talking. Uh, which one of the professors will talk with us at 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, and after this, we'll be followed by a question and answer session, okay? Professor Fabio Barbiero, please, we are honored to to hear all your contribution about Hayek and how Hayek can make a great contribution for your academic career. Good evening. I would like to thank everyone at Mises Brazil and Hayek Global College for the invitation to speak here today, especially Professor Adriano Paranaíba. My name is Fabio Barbieri. I teach economics at São Paulo University and I am one of the few economists in Brazil working on the Hayekian tradition. Adriano asked me to talk for 20 minutes about Hayek's impact on my career and the importance of his ideas. As for the first less important task, I will be very brief. When Hayek visited Brazil a few times around 1980, I was 10 years old. I discovered the author in the following decade as a physics student in the university. An introductory course exposed the classical mechanics from a historical perspective. And because of that, I came across Karl Popper's philosophy of science. And Popper dedicated his conjectures and refutation to Hayek, who in turn dedicated his studies in philosophy, politics and economics to Popper. That's how I first came into contact with Hayek's ideas, a year before his death. I realized that at that time that those two Austrian thinkers, Popper and Hayek, in fact developed the same theory, although applied it to different objects, an explanation of decentralized learning under conditions of fallible knowledge and complex reality in science and markets. The enthusiasm for this general theory of learning led me to abandon physics and study economics instead. And since then, all my academic research has been guided by the ideas of those two authors, whether applying economic concepts to the marketplace of ideas or employing theories about the growth of knowledge into the economy. Before discussing the importance of Hayek's ideas, I intend to describe the central theme of his research program. As Gerald Odebrisco noted in his book on Hayek, all contributions made by this Austrian economist are related to a coordination problem, an interpretation endorsed by Hayek himself. Let's illustrate this with a couple of examples. His study of spontaneous order of markets refers to the coordination of plans with the help of price system, while his critique of central planning deals with the lack of coordination generated by the dispersed nature of knowledge. His work on capital, in particular, investigates intertemporal coordination of plans, while his theory of cycles studies the discoordination that occurs in the capital structure induced by centralized monetary institutions. In psychology, his connectionist theory of mind investigates the coordination between impulses in the structure of nerve fibers. These result in the emergence or evolution of a sensory order, 
that allows us to interpret the world. His institutional economics, in turn, studies coordination of plans generated by the evolution of rules, rules arising from the local interaction between agents. His political philosophy shows how centralization reduces our ability to coordinate actions to a trial and error learning mechanism. Finally, his philosophical ideas investigate methodological consequences derived from the need of theories about complex phenomena necessary to explain coordination of plans in all these different fields of knowledge. The same philosopher also shows how excessive aggregation transfers the simplicity of the models to the complex world one intends to model. This aggregation ignores the relationship between the elements of those structures. This, in turn, feeds the illusion that planners could control society. Well, what kind of theory does Hayek use to address this, this problem of coordination in all these complex systems? He used uh, an evolutionary model of learning, emphasizing two elements whose presence is simultaneously required, freedom to try different solutions and a mechanism to correct errors. Like Popper, Hayek work stressed the limitation of our knowledge, our, our knowledge. I think his entire system can be summarized by the following quote extracted from his Constitution of Liberty. Uh, uh, quote, the case for individual freedom rests chiefly on the recognition of the inevitable ignorance of all of us concerning a great many of the factors on which the achievements of our ends and welfare depends. And for Hayek, the way to overcome the limitations of our knowledge and the increasing complexity of growing economies is by the adoption of institutions that promote decentralized learning. Well, with this in mind, we can finally proceed to our main task, the discussion of the importance of his ideas. If we take seriously the limitations of our knowledge, it's not enough for microeconomics to describe equilibrium states and regulate markets equating prices with marginal costs of non-products. It should also explain the emergence of coordination or learning in markets, which involves the study of institutions that guarantee free enter in markets so that entrepreneurs can discover new ways to meet our needs. For the same reason, in order to understand economic fluctuations, macroeconomists should not confine themselves to the failed search for relationships between aggregate and homogeneous concepts and to design manners to control them. But they, they have understand, they must understand how the use of policy tools, especially credit expansion, over time distorts the capital structure. Money is not neutral. Credit triggers un uh, unsustainable booms, followed by crisis and stagnation if the same set of stimulus policies are used again and again. To understand the repeated failures of government policies, economic theory should not only apply the notion of self-interest to the actions of politicians and bureaucrats, but it must also consider government failures caused by the limited knowledge of regulators operating in centralized institutional settings. Good intentions are not enough. We should focus our analysis on unintended consequences of those policies. Well, it's a very difficult task to model complex systems, learning process and unintended consequences of rules. But trying to do that is necessary if you want to address the relevant question, never easy to answer. In fact, we still face the challenge posed by the difficulty of modeling capital as a structure or generating a satisfactory theory of self-organizations in complex systems. Hayek is not, therefore, an appealing economist for dogmatic people looking for certainties and ready answers. Choosing between treatability and relevance, he always opted for relevance. This is why his work remains important today. In my opinion, a remarkable feature of his economics is the conciliation of subjectivism and complexity. His explanations all deal with conjectural entrepreneurial ideas, the external world, and the relationship between them, 
integrated in his model of decentralized learning. This perspective avoids the, the errors of supposing arbitrary expectations on one, in, on one hand, like many heterodox approaches, or an, an automatic correspondence between knowledge and the external world on the other, as in the mainstream. His theory of learning is a middle ground between these two errors. In practical terms, I, I mean, thinking in terms of policy implications, uh, this theoretical perspective implies a preference for decentralization and rejection of legal monopolies as the best way to discover its solutions to economic problems. A uh, testimony of both the relevance of the question asked and the correctness of the answers provided by Hayek is given by the test of time, despite the isolation imposed on him and Ludwig von Mises and all the opposition and distortions of their ideas, their texts remain relevant today, unlike those of many of their critics. But the recognition of a few decades late, decades later that Hayek's unpopular views were correct after all cannot be explained by a romantic thesis according to which uh, he was a misunderstood genius or something like, like that. But rather because he, as a scholar, a true scholar, can be considered an heir to the rich intellectual tradition of the economist from the previous century. The importance of time in production, the significance of competition as a discovery process uh, that involves rivalry among different entrepreneurial hypotheses, and finally the, methodo the methodology of complex phenomena are all familiar subjects in classical economy, economics. But uh, were, those were forgotten when formalism transformed the discipline and part of its intellectual capital or was lost. But science is slowly recovered part of this legacy. Institutions are once again considered important. Price theory now discusses incentives and information. Macroeconomic theory adopted micro foundations. And complex science recognizes Hayek as a forerunner. Austrian theory of cycles is discussed again. Mises and Hayek's criticism of central planning was partially recognized as correct and applied to Russia and as, as elsewhere. Privatizations and deregulation become a part of the political discussion, as well as, well as competition between currencies because of the cryptocurrencies. Uh, as we live in an economic system characterized by big interventionist states, Hayek's message is still as needed as it was in the last century. Consider, for instance, the thesis found in The Road to Serfdom about the erosion of freedom caused by the widening scope of collective action, which progressively transforms individual decisions into political questions. We can today observe many trends that illustrate the thesis about the indivisibility of freedoms, according to which reduction in economic freedom are associated with losses, losses of political freedom. Consider, for, for example, the replacement of political debate by easy moralism, the increase in the acceptance of censorship, the cancellation culture, or the ideological instrumentalization of medical treatments during the current crisis. The discussion of centralized solution based on a supposed scientific consensus immediately reminds us of San Simonian Council of Newton, criticized by Hayek in his counter-revolution of science. We need a diversity and competition of ideas, not homogeneity in the marketplace of ideas. Otherwise, our love of science turns into dogmatic scientism, the, the expression used by Hayek. In the end of his life, Hayek observed the failure of collectivism and a partial recognition of the correctness of his ideas. In the end of the road from serfdom, the interview conducted by Professor uh, Hanslet, uh, Hayek expressed a qualified optimism about the future of freedom. At the beginning of this century, however, we have witnessed the return of collectivist ideologies, exactly a century after the tragedy of totalitarian regimes. 
I believe that a reflection on this phenomenon requires an examination of Hayek's last book, The Fault of Conceit. Uh, he identified in this book tribal morality and constructivist rationalism as the two basic sources that nourish uh, collectivism, uh, uh, all sorts of collectivism. The, fascin the fascination is... Uh, <clears throat> exerced by socialism is explained by him in terms of a process of cultural, cultural evolution. And he knew the importance of ideas for institutional reforms that ignore the ideological preferences of the time are, are easily reversed. It would be very difficult to adopt competition in currency if the government realized what are the implications of this? But if we consider the scientific developments in the last few decades, especially evolutionary psychology, I believe that Hayek's explanation should be amended to give a greater role to factors relating to human nature, not just cultural evolution. In this case, the biological evolution, the task of liberal thought become more challenging. Why? Uh, as we have to discuss institutional reforms in the presence of deeper collectivist instincts, and those instincts can manifest with greater intensity when societies become more prosperous. Mm? In any case, even when we disagree with some aspects of Hayek's ideas, it is in his works that we find the richest source of inspiration. In fact, we never stop learning from his books and his articles, and I vividly recommend them to anyone seeking to understand the modern society. As the state grows, and we return to the world before the French Revolution, uh, the libertarian message from, uh, from economists, like, economists like Hayek become increasingly urgent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Fabio Barbieri. So, so we're going to transition now to Professor Hazlitt. And I have a question here for Professor Hazlitt, considering he, he was uh, an interviewer of Hayek uh, back in the day. And uh, from what I've seen in, in, in YouTube, we, we, it was in 1978. And I wanted to ask uh, Professor Hazlitt, uh, Professor Hazlitt, what was the context in which these interviews with Hayek happened? Uh, we, if you could give us like the context in which this happened and how it influenced your career too, how Hayek's ideas influenced your career, we'd like to listen you, to you talk about that. Your, your great efforts uh, in Brazil. Um, I was very fortunate uh, as a young um, uh, student even before I started graduate school, I um, had occasion to go to a conference where I met uh, Friedrich Hayek's research assistant, uh, Kurt, uh, Kurt Leuba from the University of Salzburg. And um, he um, was quite uh, uh, friendly and cooperative. And uh, I asked to interview Professor Hayek. And I actually got to interview Hayek twice, once um, before I started graduate school in 1977 in Los Angeles. When Professor Hayek um, uh, was there for for some for some other business, and that interview was actually published 15 years later uh, on the occasion of his passing, and is available online at, at Reason Magazine. The following year, I was in graduate school, and there was a project to interview Nobel Prize winners in economics that was uh, associated with the economics department at uh, the University of California, Los Angeles. So the um, the actually the opportunity came up that a couple of graduate students were included in this uh, August enterprise uh, when when Professor Hayek uh, became the uh, the subject and that interview actually took place um, in San Jose California near San Francisco and there were several of us that uh, interviewed Hayek uh, many hours of uh, uh, footage for documentary purposes was uh, set aside and it's now obviously available in in certain libraries for um for academic and and popular um uh, interest fantastic uh and 
how has it how has I Hayek's ideas influenced your career as a scholar, uh, Professor Hazlett? So you're a, a telecom you're a very renowned uh, telecommunications expert with uh, regulations policy. And uh, I was curious to know if, if uh, you got some of his insights to, to influence your career and some of the material you, you researched and wrote about. Well, sure. And, um, you know, it's just uh, it's interesting because Hayek is is uh, very well known and spent most of his career really on uh, what we would today call macroeconomics and uh, economic stability issues, uh, business cycles, uh, if you will. And he became famous as a. Uh, uh, a debate partner with uh, John Maynard Keynes for different views of what uh, what caused uh, booms and busts. But uh, to me, the uh, Hayekian uh, insight that uh, is absolutely central to economic thinking is from uh, his um, uh, famous, uh, just uh, justifiably famous 1945 article in the American Economic Review, The Use of Knowledge in Society. And in that and, and related studies and essays, he pointed out uh, something that is so obvious when you reflect on it, but uh, you know, like any great insight, it's, it's, it's very subtle and, and, and really doesn't um, uh, appear important or, or you know, it's, it's an elusive concept. And it's this, that the decisions that are important in society, whether it be economics or really anything else, the decisions are based uh, crucially on very specific information of time and place that um, are difficult to aggregate and uh, even uh, to reveal to, um, to centralized authority. So in, in many respects, we, I think we grow up in modern times thinking that uh, there are um, big centralized solutions, whether they be uh, major enterprise corporations or large government agencies that can use uh, their resources and uh, economies of scale or technology to uh, really make make um, make things happen, so to speak, and and to improve society. And uh, there's some uh, there, obviously there's some beneficial uh, aspects of economies of scale and 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 the uh, deployment of of uh, expensive technologies. But what always happens in terms of shaping actual processes is that um, individual knowledge that is very dispersed in society uh, becomes um, almost inevitably a central factor in how successful your deployments are. And um, it, it really is the uh, advance of society to learn over time better and better than we used to, and particularly over the last 300 years or so with the uh, what Deidre McCosley calls the great enrichment, uh, when, when, when incomes have really shot up and standard of living have, have tremendously improved, we've gotten better and better at actually capturing uh, the um, dispersed, the, the competitive process whereby dispersed information uh, comes in a cooperative and competitive, ironically, uh, both at the same time, cooperative and competitive means to assisting our decision making. And uh, so this uh, is the central insight of Hayek. And uh, it's, it's gone in many different directions. It's now been incorporated certainly in economic thinking uh, far and wide. Uh, at some point in his life, you could say that this was a controversial idea. And in fact, he engaged in what was called the socialist calculation controversy that in some ways uh, argued about the importance of using uh, markets and incentives to flesh out this dispersed information. But that, despite the fact that in many respects, the intellectuals uh, got, the, uh, got the arguments and, and the conclusion of that debate wrong back in the uh, 1920s, 30s, and 40s, uh, we're talking 100 years ago now, uh, now we can see a century later that, uh, in fact, the, the argument was won by Hayek, and um, and uh, he and Mises, of course, argued very, very um, uh, powerfully to some of us persuasively, not really to most intellectuals at the time. But uh, over time, they've been proven right, um, uh, and and in a way that is very widely accepted by uh, you know serious thinkers everywhere. In fact, the the flow of society has been to try to capture 
some of the efficiencies that are uh, only unleashed when we have institutions that in fact um, incentivize the discovery of dispersed information of time and place. Uh, I, I like how you mentioned that article. Uh, it's, it's the one article that we that I assigned in class for, for my students. Um, <laughs> and we talk about it in the context of, of management. And you know, a recurring question that I uh, often receive um, is that, well, how applicable is, is that nowadays? You know, the, the dispersed knowledge and the whole idea that you cannot uh, get a central board of information to, to uh, make the decisions, given that nowadays uh, we have so much data and so much technology to organize our, our data and uh, we could theoretically make better decisions given that we have all this technology and all this data at, at our disposal. So I wanted to ask you about that, Sue, give, give you back that question that the students often give me. Well, yeah, but that's exactly the point is that what, 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 are, what are the data? The data are individual bits of information and we're, we're, we're investing enormously and in, in, in many respects, very successfully to accumulate that data. And that data, as everyone knows, is extremely valuable. It's extremely valuable just because that's what runs the system. Now, uh, to say that it's centralized and you can disperse or do away with the systems that are incentivizing people to reveal their information is, uh, uh, I guess, superficially appealing, but it's uh, exactly in the wrong direction. Uh, let me uh, maybe briefly say something about our intuition on this, um, which turns out to be quite important, just the way we are wired as human beings to think about uh, the way markets use interpersonal relationships uh, that necessarily has all this uh, scattered information of, of great importance. Um, Adam Smith, uh, you know, the, uh, the acknowledged founder of the, the study of economics, um, almost 250 years ago, uh, he, um, he, he did not just write uh, his famous 19, uh, 19, 1776 uh, book on the wealth of nations. Uh, he, he wrote uh, a previous book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And it's interesting to consider both books uh, together. The Theory of Moral Sentiments um, had a lot to do with how morally people actually in their own circles, their, their friends, their neighbors, their families, uh, how they behave interacting with, with, uh, in, these, in these communities and uh, how they make decisions, how, how the family unit uh, actually um, is so important in society. And families are interesting because we don't use the price mechanism much. We don't uh, try to incentivize people to uh, conserve on, uh, uh, on, on, on um, the, the meat being served to family dinner by forcing them to uh, pay at an auction price for it. We, we actually make different kinds of decisions. We have different kinds of relationships with these people. Um, and, and it's because we're, we're not in interpersonal situations where uh, we don't know what the different specific information is so much. Uh, we don't have uh, the invisible hand so much. We have visible hands. We, we know what people are doing. We see their information. They see ours. Anyway, we have, we have different ways of thinking about that. We even have different moral codes that develop that uh, you, you don't treat people uh, as, as though they have to pay for everything uh, to, uh, you know, or to work for everything. And families uh, we have, um, you know, lots of specialization and different tasks, but we um, we, we operate on a on, on a different uh, on a different code. When you go into the impersonal marketplace that has developed so magnificently in the last uh, 250 years since uh, since Adam Smith, that's a different side of us, a different side of society, where we want people who live in in different continents to produce for what we want to buy. And we want them to buy what we can sell. And 
the, this enormous, the, the, the enormous advantages of interaction and trade amongst people who do not know each other and cannot have um, judgments about their knowledge, their information, even their, their moral behavior, this, this interpersonal interaction uh, yields uh, really different kinds of structures and behaviors and institutions. And so it's very natural that in some ways we think about, um, you know, people should just do the right thing. And if they all just cooperate, if everybody just gets along, everything will work out fine, because that's the way we grow up thinking in a family structure, more or less, uh, particularly in, in good, healthy um, uh, um, environments. Um, on the other hand, when it comes to cooperating amongst the, you know, thousands, millions, now billions of individuals who are uh, potentially partners in coordinated and very productive efforts, we can't have that kind of close-knit situation. We don't know very much about their circumstances or ours. So I can, uh, and, and many people around the world today, can walk outside their door and have somebody uh, who they don't know, who came maybe from a different country, came from halfway around the world, offering to give them a ride in a car to where they want to go. And the interaction is just seamless. We, we, we don't know them, but we trust them. We, we trust that they will charge us a fair price. Uh, if it's on our software app, we already know what the price is. Uh, and, with some, and, and, and we've already paid for it with our uh, credit mechanisms. And, um, and we have these interactions that are that are based upon different forms of trust or moral judgments uh, than what we have in the in, in the family situation. So when it comes to looking at the world today and how it's evolving and how information is utilized, it, it, it doesn't surprise me that many people would revert uh, to, uh, to, to a very natural human tendency to say, well, you know, um, sharing information or generating these, uh, these new forms of information processing is, is, is is suspicious or, uh, or, or a solution, a solution that does away with our uh, need to have, uh, you know, arm's length transactions uh, in which price mechanisms and competitive processes are, are, um, uh, are foundational. And uh, it's, it's, it's a sort of a, a little trick of nature. It is a bit confusing. And we've been confused by it for a few hundred years now, probably a few thousand years, a few millennia. Um, or more, because uh, you know, you're as a human being, your tribal existence uh, that comes up through thousands of generations evolves into something that really is challenged by change, economic change, and, and societal advance. And so, um, I think that uh, that Hayek, in, in his uh, description of how we use knowledge, uh, has has been a a, a very uh, central part to this argument and this way of thinking. And of course, he himself got very much into, uh, you know, the, the deeper questions of, of psychology and uh, uh, how people fundamentally make judgments. And it was uh, this uh, straight out of his thinking about how important uh, were the little pieces of information that we might have as individuals uh, and can reveal to others, but generally will do so most effectively when we have a, an incentive structure and a competitive system that uh, that rewards us for um, for productive use of that uh, data. This is uh, very powerful uh, what you just said, and, and as you said, it's subtle. How uh, we are living in uh, the most pro prosperous time in humanity, and as you said, that with the hockey stick of human prosperity in the last years, and we don't stop generally to think about what is it that is making all this happen, right? And it's all these uh, market interactions with strangers, as, as you just said. And I think a powerful example is that when we go into an airplane, we don't need to know that who the pilot is, if he's a good person, if he's a bad person. We just know that we go into the airplane, the pilot flies the, the plane, and we trust him along with uh, many other interactions that we have with strangers in our day-to-day -day lives. And uh, it's, it's part of this Hayekian insight, right? That it's probably very underappreciated um, in the social sciences in general still, uh, despite being so powerful. And uh, one of the applications that um, I mention generally is, I wanted also Charles Koch uses in his book uh, when he talks about management, 
which is the decentralized knowledge. The, to, to, to have in mind the decentralized knowledge and the, the power that people at the, the, the end uh, uh, of the spectrum, of the, the hierarchy of the company, who are actually you know, dealing with the customers, the ones that are uh, have, doing the day-to-day -day operations of the company, have so much more information than the CEO could possibly ever have. And that's an insight that could be also be used um, in, in management, right? And then another, and many other aspects of, of, of outside yeah. of economics too. Yes, well, I mean, this, it's a very interesting uh, intersection here because uh, in terms of, of the influence and in, actually in my economic thinking, um, uh, I, had, I had read Hayek even before graduate school and I'd been fascinated by this, these central ideas of dispersed information. And, uh, but uh, at, at UCLA, I was a student of Harold Demsetz and became very familiar with the, the writings um, of uh, Armin Alchin, Harold Demsetz, and Ronald Coase. And all of them uh, are very Hayekian <laughs> uh, in, in their own analyses, even though in some respects, they're not always, um, they're not always lumped or bundled. Uh, as um, peas in a pod, so to speak. And, um, but the, you know, Ronald Coase, uh, um, who was um, almost a contemporary of, um, born 11 years later than uh, Friedrich Hayek, of course, uh, Coase being British. But um, he, um, he started thinking about how corporations use, firms, companies used information. And it's very, um, you know, it's again, it's not so intuitive. Uh, corporations seem to be going away from the market. They're not dealing with individuals and customers and suppliers on uh, on the uh, on the basis of the price system for all their transactions. They actually put teams together, and uh, you know, you mentioned uh, Coke or Coke Industries, very large. Uh, enterprises can be built uh, where, again, you've got very dispersed information within the organization and decision makers uh, at the top and all through the organization are constantly um, trying to coordinate amongst the various uh, workers, managers, members of the team, how they can produce something beneficial for customers uh, and also have good interactions with their suppliers, make efficient purchases for inputs. And it's a, it's a very challenging information problem. And uh, Coase actually did talk about the difference between uh, firms wanting to do things internally because they thought they could sort of, uh, you know, beat the market, so to speak. They could, they could produce maybe some inputs or have certain um, kinds of, um, say, research and development processes that it would be better for them in a firm to do uh, rather than to purchase it from other suppliers. Um, you, you know, so it's always this trade-off of using the market and uh, letting competition amongst all your potential suppliers provide information or, you know, generate, make your own investments internally. And um, it's, uh, that, 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 that paper is, is one of the top 10 papers in economics in terms of citations. It's a very simple, idea and it really just extends the Hayekian thinking on information's dispersal and it does it within the context of firms competing in the marketplace and making choices amongst these trade-offs and uh, it's uh, it's something that finance and corporate governance uh, which is a legal field a very very important uh, aspect of corporate law uh, and of course uh, industrial organization are very much focused on even today, uh, many years after Coase uh, uh, wrote about this in his famous article, The Nature of the Firm, 1937, that was published, and then um, Friedrich Hayek's famous 1945 paper, The Use of Information in Society. So these fundamental ideas um, motivate um, many of us, and uh, you know, to in long form answer your question, they certainly motivate my study of regulatory institutions. Very nice. Thank you very much, Professor Hazlett, for uh, the, these insights. Uh, I, I would like to to uh, 
turn to another topic here, uh, also on some of Hayek's uh, themes, and, and re it's related a little bit with your interview with him, um, that Hayek, throughout his, his writings and through his talks, he was uh, always showed his desire to change the public opinion on uh, the... To, to, to become more classical, liberally inclined or libertarian ideas, and so that this would influence public policy in, in the long run. He, he, he believed that uh, much, much more than electing the right officials to run the, the, the country, it would be much bene more beneficial if we would uh, change the public um, opinion. And um, how do you see uh, the evolution of these ideas uh, since Hayek since you interviewed Hayek in, in 1978, you could talk about well, it in the context I mean, of the United States or. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, you know, you talk about Hayek and the classical business cycle theory, there are booms and busts and they're in intellectual uh, uh, progress and uh, advance as well. Um, and um, interestingly with Hayek, you know, he, he told me that uh, uh, when he was a young man, uh, only the older men were interested in um, in in uh, the foundational ideas of a liberal society. Uh, and now he said, as an old man, I find it's the younger people uh, who are much more interested. He said, in between, in the post World War II period, uh, the consensus in favor of socialism um, coming out um, of um, World War II, really the uh, uh, you know, the uh, European countries were going towards welfare state. Uh, uh, the, uh, the United States had gone through the New Deal uh, during the immediate pre-war period. And, um, and, and uh, of course, the rise of communism uh, was, uh, at least numerically, uh, supplemented uh, with the... Um, with the, with the you know, the fall of the regime in China and the rise of Mao Zedong. So there was this period where, uh, you know, Hayek I thought that he was uh, one of the, you know, one of the only people who, who had the, a liberal thought uh, amongst the intellectual class. Uh, so that changed quite a bit. And Hayek became very popular in his later days. And it was uh, reflected partly in the award of the Nobel Prize in 1974. But uh, it was really much, much broader. Uh, and more extensive than that, and and uh, he became quite influential, particularly of course in uh, in England, and um, had some uh, influence at the uh, Institute of Economic Affairs, and um, and and literally briefed Maggie Thatcher uh, prior to her becoming um, uh, Prime Minister of England, and um, and and his ideas were were in ascendancy. There's a wonderful book on this. That called by Daniel Jurgen, uh, called the Commanding Heights, and uh, it was published about 1998, and it it really went through um, much of this trend uh, away from uh, socialism and, and, and towards uh, liberalism. Um, uh, you know, uh, by about uh, the, the end of the last millennium, uh, people would say that uh, maybe the uh, uh, you know, the, 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 um, that, that was the good point to sell your stock, uh, that um, despite the collapse of, um, uh, you know, the communist bloc, so to speak, um, the demise of the Soviet Union, and, um, you know, what some people called the end of history, a little prematurely, it turns out, uh, there were, you know, tremendous advances. Um, uh, and even in the United States, there had been a deregulation wave as early as the 1970s, where there was a broad consensus that uh, competition was much more important, open competition, uh, which, which, which would allow for um, really, um, uh, you, know, um, you know, much better performance, uh, had become quite, uh, quite a consensus item. And that was not just due to the influence of, of Hayek and uh, scholars uh, of the liberal bent. It was uh, people discovering that many of the regulatory solutions uh, in the United States in particular adopted during the 1930s and the Great Depression 
uh, had not worked out very well, that they were extremely anti-consumer. And so regulations that were regulating airline fares and uh, regulating shipping uh, and trucking, uh, they, those agencies were actually abolished in the 1980s and 90s because they had been raising prices and uh, really creating quite the, quite the social dislocation. In fact, uh, creating environmental problems uh, in, in terms of their inefficient use of resources. So uh, that, um, that, that was uh, very interesting to Hayek, the fact that the world had gone uh, in, in many respects in, in the direction that he was very excited about and, and, and happy to take some credit for. Uh, and um, yet now, um, you know, the, you know the, the end of history has not arrived. The, the debate continues. Uh, I tend to be optimistic, but uh, uh, there's no doubt that there are many challenges with the, um, the emergence of um, uh, new markets and uh, new technologies, including social media, and how um, education and um, public debate take place. And um, uh, many of our institutions are struggling with this. And uh, we will, uh, I, I think it's more important than ever that this long run view of Hayek, uh, who, who, who once uh, said, uh, he, he really wasn't interested in, in uh, participating in the debate about what happened today. He was trying to influence what happened in 50 years from now. And so it's that long run thinking really is, um, you know, at the, at the end of the road, so important. And, um, and I think that um, it has become quite influential. Uh, and of course, in many respects, we have gotten to that long, that long run outcome where the ideas that were planted some years ago are, are, are having great influence, uh, whether they be liberal ideas or, or other viewpoints. So, um, you know, as, as intellectuals, um, you know, in, involved in the, um, in the debate over ideas, um, it's, it's, you know, you can, you can go into, uh, uh, you know, the issues of the moment and there's a you know, <laughs> specialization and there are gains from uh, specialization. And some people are very good at participating in, in the, um, uh, the, um, the hot topic items of, of the moment. And I, I must say that I'm interested in many of these regulatory issues participate, uh, with, uh, essays and op-eds and, um, uh, and, and, you know, debating some of those issues. Um, but at the same time, the foundational work of scholars like Hayek is absolutely essential and has been uh, really quite, um, quite an enterprise. And, uh, you know, he mentions things like the Institute for Economic Affairs in, um, in my interview with him. Uh, he's very happy to participate in something that was not uh, going to be a success or failure within the next uh you know, 24 to 72 hours. It's something that would pay off over 50 or 100 years. Uh, it, yes, it's uh, pretty remarkable uh, the, how Hayek's ideas and those are uh, uh, the intellectuals such as Hayek are, are so timeless, right? And here we are uh, many years later talking about Hayek and, and his ideas in this webinar. In a wholly different, very different world. Uh, I have a question here from Fabio Barbieri, who is still having problems with his microphone, so he sent over a question uh, for you. Uh, in the end of the interview uh, that you did with Hayek, uh, in the road to serfdom, Hayek expressed uh, some qualified optimism about the future of freedom, and you talked a little bit about that, right? Of how the social social media is um has its role today and uh how do, do, do you think what would you think hayek would answer today do, do you think his answer would be different today if he were to answer the same question uh no i don't uh and remember you know with all the disappointments and some of the um uh the rise of social media and um in my uh, the book uh, 2017, I'll give a plug to my uh, book, The Political Spectrum, the uh, uh, tumultuous liberation of wireless technology from Herbert Hoover to the smartphone. Uh, I quote um, the uh, tech guru, Clay Shirky, who said, uh, 
uh, we were very excited that the internet would allow us to find out what everybody believes. It has been a huge disappointment. And uh, this is the uh, sort of the boom and the bust right there in, uh, in some of the new platforms. They're tremendously uh, progressive in getting us to a situation where the common man can broadcast uh, his or her thoughts, uh, uh, so to speak, to the world. And um, that kind of uh, freedom uh, cannot be taken lightly. It's extremely important. And, you know, we, we look back to and we see how centralized controls tended to uh, eliminate free thought, free idea, free speech, and, and lead to very bad outcomes. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, media uh, and, and the enclosure of, of, of free thought has uh, had a very unheroic role in uh, many, uh, many very bad outcomes and even totalitarian regimes. But uh, of course, the platforms that have developed are not an unmixed blessing. That, that, is, uh, that, that is clear even for many of the uh, enthusiastic entrepreneurs uh, who rightfully take uh, uh, pride in, in much of what uh, has been created. Uh, there are um, questions about uh, mediation and uh, editorial control and, um, and simple civility. And uh, we, you know, we haven't exactly mastered that. Um, but Hayek would look at the long term. And in, in my opinion, you asked me to speak for Hayek, so <laughs> um, I guess that's what happens when he's not here to defend himself. So uh, my guess is that Hayek would look at the long term and um, be confident that there will be institutions, that there, there is a demand uh, for, um, uh, for, for, for progress and, and uh, even civility, uh, as well as uh, for, um, you know, the, the useful utilization of technologies, the new communications for um, uh, you know, personal and social growth. And uh, we're struggling with that. That's not unusual for the, uh, the, you know, the technologies that have come before us have had, uh, uh, particularly communications technologies, have always had kickback and problems and, uh, uh, and, and challenges. So the, the institutions that develop here, um, I think will continue to expand our freedom um, and, uh, rules will um, will change as well. Um, you know, I live in a common law country where we quite uh, naturally uh, develop new rules for new new situations. And, uh, and, and all around the world, of course, there's legislation and there are, you know, there are policy fixes, sometimes in the right direction, sometimes in the wrong direction. Society has to learn how to accommodate uh, the new opportunities without squelching uh, the very Found of, of of the progress itself, and that's that's the challenge to come up with with rules that are supportive and accommodative, uh, and allow the progress to flow, but do deal with some of the um, uh, do deal with some of the protections that uh, you know the the, the population uh, in a democracy certainly, but even in, in less democratic countries is going to demand, and um, so we'll see how this plays out. You're asking for uh, an opinion. You're actually asking for somebody else's opinion. I would think that Friedrich Hayek would be very optimistic that these technologies um, will play out in a, in a rather positive way, and uh, the road will be a bit bumpy. It is now, uh, but um, we um, uh, we will benefit um, from the competition uh, within countries and, and between countries uh, that allows us to do so much more with uh, the opportunities that we now have. Fantastic. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I like how you, you, you have this optimism with the social networks, how we would expand our freedom, even though uh, we see sometimes um, how it puts us in, in bubbles of uh, thoughts and we have all these uh, negative uh, Happenings, things that happen with with the social networks, uh, it it might be a process, right, of uh, spontaneous order where the, the public opinion will have having this freedom will be able to uh, evolve into uh, better insights in the future. Uh, I would like to okay. now open to the public, to whoever's watching us now, to send us the, any questions you might have. Uh, 
Maybe wait a few moments till, until people think about their questions. And if you can, go ahead and send it in the chat in YouTube, and we're going to read it here. Um, you could either ask to Fabio Bahabieri or to uh, Tom, Professor Hazlett. Uh, we have a, a question here from Gabriel Bajos. What is the best way to build a freer world being a common person? <laughs> well, we're all common people. I hope, uh, I hope we're all common. Um, and uh, yeah, I think to get engaged in the, uh, in the world of ideas is extremely important. And one of the problems we have um, to the extent that uh, I can frame it as a problem, maybe it's a challenge because it's very natural, is that um, uh, with uh, the ease of broadcasting, entry into the world of speech now, uh, much, uh, in many respects, much easier than it ever has been in, in all of history. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's kind of a bias uh, it's not, you know, the, the, the urge and the ability to speak is not uh, sort of randomly distributed. And um, in many respects, um, you know, there are, you know, this has been pointed out by many people of uh, many political stripes that uh, those who engage in, in discourse um, and intellectual thought and um, social advance on the, um, on the intellectual front that uh, they, they gravitate towards uh, certain, um, um, certain ideas that um, are not so sophisticated. Let's, uh, let's, let's be generous. And uh, so those who are um, willing to uh, make the investments uh, to discover um, the, the source of our success in many respects, as well as the source of our failure in others, uh, should, um, in good spirit and with civility, um, in my opinion, should, should uh, uh, as they will, as they can, as they might, as they're motivated, uh, engage in um, their own education, their own um, uh, activities, and then, um, and, and, and then um, participate in this, this great challenge we have today uh, to uh, to discuss uh, what we might modestly call the future of the world, and uh, you know there have been revolutions in in, in many dimensions of social life, uh, uh, starting with the, the industrial revolution and coming through to the the current age of um, artificial intelligence, and uh, uh, I call them exciting opportunities. Uh, uh, some people call them by less uh, uh, beneficial names, but uh, the um, the fact is, if we um, uh, allow debates to be uh, dominated uh, by um, uh, you know certain um, uh, you know antisocial elements, uh, shall we say, uh, that that uh, you know in some respects that's on us. We you know we should uh, try to understand uh, the uh, the reasonable viewpoints in a debate and to uh, uh, afford respect to the participants, and then um, uh, build a humane society around uh, our understanding and our ability to express our ideas to uh, our fellow uh, our fellow citizens. So I, I, I think that the common person has not only a large role in this, you know, ultimately the, um, you know, perhaps the decisive role, this, despite the importance of intellectuals, um, and there's no question, that interest groups and intellectuals are very much a part of this, um, you know, the process uh, in the flow and the, uh, uh, and, and the uh, creation of, of all those groups comes from, um, uh, comes, comes from people who might describe themselves in this way to start with. So I would, uh, the fact that you're, 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 you know, you're listening to these kinds of uh, discussions and thinking these kinds of thoughts and trying to discover uh, what uh, a great intellectual like um, F.A. Hayek might have had to say, that, that indicates that you're already giving um, uh, time and thought to uh, the, uh, the challenges of today and that you're very important um, and uh, perhaps decisive in, uh, in the success we might have. 
So to, to summarize, if you want to build a better world, watch our webinars. <laughs> <laughs> well put. <laughs> uh, is there, uh, there's another question here from Leonardo Mendonça. Uh, it, it's an intriguing question, really. Uh, I, I'm, I'm quite often intrigued by that because China is a very big, powerful capitalist uh, nation with, with so much uh, commerce going on there. But at the same time, they live a, a dictatorship. And he's asking, uh, is there a possibility that China will stop being a dictatorship because of the power of its own market? Mm. Wow. Um, I hope you put that in the form of a question to Hayek because he might, he might do better with that than, uh, than Hazlitt. Um, and this is, of course, one of the great uh, questions. Um, you know, China, uh, I don't have to tell you, has come so far. And um, uh, I, I call the, uh, the death of Chairman Mao. And um, uh, it was um, rather amazing that the, the West, in many ways, uh, mourned um, in, in many of the uh, publications and public responses to the uh, to the passing of uh, uh, of, of that regime and that in that era, uh, which was um, a very very curious and, and defeatist attitude by the West, in my opinion. And of course, the uh, the years uh, thereafter. Uh, laid bare the uh, the enormity of, of both the terror uh, and the uh, and the inefficiency of that communist regime, and made such great strides that um, we, you know, we're delighted. The world is better off, and certainly the Chinese people in general are better off. Yet it hasn't again been. Um, all sweetness and light and, and, and the world, uh, you know, history is still here and the challenges remain. And uh, uh, there's no question that China engages, you know, the policies engage uh, in ways that are very dictatorial. And um, uh, we, you know, uh, we, we can see the great um, uh, contrast between Hong Kong and China and, and the, uh, and, and the challenges uh, uh, and uh, real, um, you know, assault on, on, the, on the freedom of the Hong Kong people that, that um, gives us just a, 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 a stark contrast and, and a calibration of um, how controlled the environment is and thought and free speech are in, um, in the largest country in the world. So, um, Again, I tend to be an optimist. The, uh, the forces of the market have pushed China uh, to, um, to a place which is, uh, without question, better than it, than it was. And, um, and, uh, and, and that's, that's been enormously important to, for the Chinese and for the world. Uh, but we're certainly not home free on that. And I can't tell you at this point um, exactly how it's going to play out or how fast. I, I, as I said, I remain optimistic that we're on a trajectory that's positive. But um, I think that, um, uh, that obviously the, um, uh, the, you know, the, the international situation with respect to China and then the domestic um, you know, policy within China is, uh, is, is of uh, great concern. Great. And Tom, last question, uh, it's a challenging question. Who would you say are the Hayek and Mises of our days, the, the, Mar, the, Mar, the, the Hayek Mises scholars of our time? From Pedro Well, Mutti. yeah, good. No, thank you for asking about that one because that, that's uh, the, uh, for me, the, the easy, uh, that's a, there's an easy answer, uh, on, on the Hayek side of that. And that is, uh, Thomas Sowell, uh, who wrote, um, a book, uh, which is so Hayekian at its, at its core, um, called, uh, Knowledge and Decisions. And for any student wanting to really understand how Hayekian ideas are applied, not only in the economy, but in politics, in the law, in social context, uh, you you really um, have a treat uh, 
awaiting you if you have not read Knowledge and Decisions. And there are many wonderful Thomas Sowell books, but uh, that's, uh, in, in terms of his economics, that's the crowning jewel. And so I also, having been a student at UCLA when Tom Sowell was on the faculty there and um, being made aware of him and, and starting to read his books way back in graduate school, uh, I, have, um, I have benefited enormously from his explanation and application of Hayekian thinking, which of course is uh, in many respects, um, uh, you know, identical to uh, Misesian thinking on uh, socialist calculation and so forth. So that would be the, um, the living economist who's uh, on, on the uh, still after all these years at 90, 90 uh, he just turned 91 last week, this week. Um, yeah, uh, Tom Soule. Fantastic, great choice. <laughs> Thomas Sowell is fantastic. So we're, we reached here uh, already the, the end of our, our webinar. Um, I would like to thank so much uh, Professor Hazlitt for uh, participating today and his contributions. Uh, thank you so much for Adriano Paranaiba, Professor uh, Barbieri too for uh, joining us. Unfortunately, we have some problems with his microphone and perhaps we'll have another opportunity to interact more. Uh, and uh, thank uh, the Mises Brazil Institute for putting together such a fantastic event. And uh, we're here at Hayek Global College, very glad to, to be in this partnership. And uh, for everybody out there, please stay tuned in. We're gonna have many other events like this and uh, hope to, to see you next time too. And I'll pass the word here to Adriano for his uh, final words too. Yes. Yeah, so Thank you very much to this great uh, event. Unfortunately, we have problems with Professor Fabio Barbieri sound. And thank you very much, uh, Professor Tom Hazlitt, to talk with us. And uh, at least but not last, I want to invite everybody to send papers for our call of papers for Mrs. Journal. Uh, this year's our special issue is about uh, the 150 anniversary celebration of publication of uh, uh, Principles of Economics of Menger. Uh, and this year's the hour year. And send your paper at uh, uh, mrsjournal.argo.br. Thank you very much for attention. And thank you very much, professors, to, uh, to uh, a great uh, talk with us today. I read that book. I read Menger's book. That's that's oh. how I learned marginal value. That he taught me marginal value. That that's a great choice. And I didn't. I hadn't thought that it's 150th. That's great. Good for you. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Thank you, everyone. Então, pessoal, esse foi o nosso primeiro seminário acadêmico do Instituto Mises Brasil, em parceria com o Hayek Global College. Esse é o primeiro de muitos, então siga as nossas redes sociais, é, marca o sininho aí para você sempre estar tá recebendo notificação de novos vídeos, além das outras redes sociais, Facebook, Instagram, porque mais do que novos seminários, muitas novidades acadêmicas estão por vir nessa grande parceria do Instituto Mises com o Hayek Global College.